This video is sponsored by PCBWay. Hello there and welcome back to another video. In today's video, I'll be doing a little project that I've wanted to do for a while, just for the fun of it. I want to build a somewhat powerful speaker amplifier with a bridged TDA 2050 circuit. So let's jump straight into it with the prototyping. I'm going to be using this circuit diagram that I found on the DIY audio forums, which I'll be linking to in the description. Some key features of this circuit are that the main amplifier chips are, as expected, TDA 2050s, and there are two of them because it's a bridged circuit. Additionally, the circuit needs to be run off of a dual rail supply, meaning that I'll need to provide a positive voltage potential, a zero volt potential, and a negative voltage potential. My specific reasons for wanting to use this circuit and these chips is that one, I already have a bunch of 2050s on hand and I would like to mess with them more, and two, it seems to be a relatively simple design to work with. So I threw it together on some breadboards and started experimenting. You may notice several large capacitors on the main power rails, and these aren't noted in the schematic that I'm basing this off of. I chose to add these to the circuit because I'm going to be powering the circuit off of a power supply that doesn't have much capacitance on its output. That's not a bad thing, it's just noteworthy in this case. That's because due to the nature of this circuit, especially when it's being pushed harder, there will be quite a bunch of power transients, which are short bursts of high power draw from the power supply. The idea is that these capacitors can provide that current to the amplifier as the power supply might be too slow to do that. But hey, the circuit is all built up now, so let's see if it works. I set up a small fan powered by a different power supply that's blowing on the TDA 2050s. These chips are not very efficient, and so they're going to get very hot, and this fan will be needed with these tiny heat sinks. I also connected an audio source and then placed an upside down glass dish over the circuit. This may not make much sense yet, and I could explain my reasoning for this now, but its purpose will actually be demonstrated shortly, so we'll just wait until then. After that, I connected a speaker to the board and pulled up a classic speaker test, Crab Rave. However, the amplifier was not behaving as I'd expected it to. Even at maximum output volume on the computer, the amplifier was barely doing anything, definitely not outputting 64 watts like the schematic specified. What's going on here? I first checked for loose connections, however, none seemed to be present. After some more fiddling around with the circuit, and double checking that I had hooked up everything properly, I found my error. I had connected these little sets of 22 microfarad capacitors and 680 ohm resistors to pin 4 on both of the chips rather than pin 2. Now, pin 4 and pin 2 are connected, but they're connected through a 22 kilo ohm resistor, so these components were on the wrong side of that resistor and were therefore causing the problem. And with that fixed, I put a heavily bass boosted and low passed version of Crab Rave on to test the power output of the amplifier without being too loud. And as you can see, it's working a lot better now. So the amplifier is clearly working. And up until now, I've been testing it with a voltage source of plus minus 18 volts paired with a two amp current limit. I then decided to raise both the voltage and current values to values that should still be within spec those being a plus minus 20 volt supply and a three amp current limit. However, when I plugged it into the amplifier, it expressed its disagreement with my choice. The entire front of one of the TDA 2050 chips blew off and the other one was cracked and also clearly dead. I've used these chips before and have experimented with them in weird ways and I've actually had this happen before, hence the glass dish. Funnily enough, the explosion that happened here is the least violent one I've had yet. Usually, the chips blow off their top right corners with such force that I hear shrapnel bouncing all around my room. And this is one of the reasons why I always wear safety glasses when testing circuits. Clearly, I should just stick to a plus minus 18 volt supply with the specific chips that I have. Though, that explosion was concerning for this circuit, and actually, there was something other than the voltage that I believe to be the most likely cause of this explosion. And I'll be sharing that shortly, so I don't actually know if the plus minus 20 volt supply was the reason for this. In any case, I wanted to see a rough number for the amount of current that we were pushing to the speaker, just out of curiosity, because on my power supply at times, I saw indication that we were drawing around two amps on the input. So I set my current clamp meter up on one of the speaker's wires and set it to AC amperage. This is most definitely not a perfect or insanely accurate way to measure this current, but I just want a rough reading here. I played a 30 hertz sine wave through the speaker at a pretty reasonable volume. The sine wave's frequency lines up perfectly with my camera's frame rate, by the way, so it doesn't look like the speaker is moving, but I assure you, it is. During this, the speaker was getting around 2 amps of current, which is pretty decent. I then switched to a 20 hertz wave that raised the current draw to around 3 amps. It also heated up the speaker and amplifier a lot, so I stopped it pretty quickly. 
I then decided to grab a smaller driver and see how hard the amplifier could push it. But before I started playing sound through it, I measured its resistance to ensure it wasn't below 8 ohms, as 8 ohms is pretty much the lowest load that this amplifier circuit can allegedly handle. This smaller speaker measured in at about 6 ohms, which is slightly too low for this amplifier. At this same time, I decided I might as well measure the impedance of the speaker that I've been using this whole time, even though I was practically certain that it was an 8 ohm driver. Well, funny story, this old Sony driver is not an 8 ohm speaker like I was sure it was. Nope, it's measuring in at a little under 4 ohms, which means it's likely overloading the amplifier chips. Yeah. That's what probably caused the circuit to blow when I used a 20 volt 3 amp supply. As you can see the speaker move and then the chip explodes. Definitely learn from me here. Even if you're pretty sure about a component's value, you should always still double check it. So technically both of these drivers are too low impedance for this amplifier. However, as long as I don't drive it exceptionally hard, it seems to be okay with driving them. And since I'm still just experimenting with the circuit on a breadboard, and I don't have a finalized amplifier board I don't want to break, I just decided to play with the smaller driver on the amp for a while. I threw some bassy music through it, and it was just fun to mess around with, especially because the amplifier could push this speaker pretty hard. I also plugged in this 5x7 car speaker, and decided to play one of my background songs on it as a quick sound quality test. I have a more proper sound quality test coming at the end of the video, so if that's something you really care about, don't fret, I have one that I recorded with a proper microphone coming up. Overall though, the amplifier was seemingly doing pretty well. Next up, I wired the 5x7 and the Sony woofer in series to create an 8 ohm load and stressed the amp out for a while. I wanted to verify that it would behave well with the proper 8 ohm load before I transferred it to a PCB. The amplifier seemed to be performing well though, and because of this, I sat down and designed a PCB for it. Once I had my PCB design, I sent it off to the sponsor of today's video, PCBWay, and about a week later, I had some beautiful custom boards ready to be stuffed with components. PCBWay is a manufacturer of high quality custom parts, and they offer several services which are suitable for all kinds of projects. They offer 3D printing, CNC machining, PCB production and assembly, and more. Today, I've got some PCBs fresh off of their PCB production line, and I'm going to be using these boards to make my speaker amplifier. If PCBWay's services interest you at all, go ahead and check them out at the link in the video description. I used several SMD components in this circuit because I'm finally starting to feel comfortable with working with them, and they're going to be much more compact than their through-hole counterparts would be. So all of the resistors in the design, as well as all of the capacitors that aren't exceptionally large, are SMD this time, which I'm pretty happy about. I soldered all of these parts to the board to start, and once that was done, I put the microscope away and started soldering all of the through-hole components on. With all of the through-hole components soldered on, I've got to say, I'm pretty happy with how the board turned out. I like how compact it is, which I think is certainly in part due to my usage of SMD components, but also the simplicity of the design. My heatsink was still in the mail at this time, so I attached some tiny heatsinks to the 2050s to keep them cool enough for me to test the board. I hooked everything up, put it under another glass dish because I don't fully trust the 2050s just yet, and hooked up 8 ohms worth of speakers to its output. To my relief, nothing exploded this time, and the amplifier seemed to be working flawlessly. There was a weird hum in it, but I discovered that the hum was caused by my lights, which is interesting. Probably the dirt cheap AC adapter that I'm using for them, if I had to guess what's causing it. The next day, my heatsink for the amplifier arrived, and I was ready to finish this project off. I chose a pretty massive heatsink for this amplifier because of how incredibly hot the TDA 2050s get. The TDA 2050 chip is classed as a Class AB amplifier, and in general, these amplifiers reach efficiencies of around 50 to 70 percent. Yeah, that's a lot of heat dissipation into the heatsink, so it's going to need to be pretty large. I marked the correct spots to drill for screws on the heatsink and took it down to the garage to drill and tap the holes for the screws. It went about as well as one can expect, meaning that I only had to drill out one snap screw, and then I mounted the 2050s to the heatsink with some thermal paste. A quick thing to keep in mind, sometimes in circuits with heatsink mounted components, you will need to ensure that the metal back of the component doesn't make electrical contact with the heatsink. Something that I didn't know about these style of components when I was starting out is that the metal parts on the back of them are oftentimes electrically connected to one of the pins on the chip itself. And if you have two chips that cannot have those pins connected together, they need to be isolated from the heatsink or the heatsink will form that forbidding connection. In the case of these TDA 2050s, the metal mounting points are electrically connected to pin 3 of the chips, and on both of the 2050s in this circuit, 
pin 3 is connected to the negative voltage potential, meaning that I don't necessarily have to isolate them from the heatsink because it doesn't matter if both of their V- pins are connected together because they already are in the PCB. I will note though, this does mean that the heatsink will be energized with the negative 18 volt potential of the circuit. Because of this, it's more ideal and safer to still isolate the chips, for the sake of not energizing the heatsink, but I've lost all of my isolation hardware, so for today, the heatsink is energized with a non-dangerous voltage, and it's just important to keep it from grounding out on anything at this point. But with the board in its final form, completed by the comically large heatsink, I messed around with it and some bassy music a little more before setting up a proper microphone and recording a sound quality test. I turned out the lights for this test to get rid of the buzz that they introduced to the amplifier, so I'll just play this sound sample over a black screen. The speakers are being recorded exactly as they have been sitting on the table during these tests, which isn't an ideal setup, but it should give a basic idea of whether or not the amplifier distorts. I recorded this audio with an Audio-Technica AT4040 microphone positioned about one foot above the speakers, pointing down at them with no post-processing. Here's just a sample of the song playing in the timeline of this video so that you can hear what it sounds like regularly on your system, before I switch over to the audio from the amplifier's sound test. Listening to the raw song and the amplifier's audio on my monitors, I can say that this doesn't sound like it's the cleanest amplifier ever made by any stretch of the imagination. I can't speak on frequency response because the speakers that it's playing through make it pretty impossible to form any opinion on the amplifier itself in regard to that metric, but it does seem to distort a reasonable amount, especially on the kick drum. Here, as just a fun reference to throw in, this is what this song sounds like on one of my Atom Audio T5V Studio monitors, and this sample has been recorded in the same way as the DIY amp sample. Alright, most certainly not a top tier amplifier by any means, but definitely a top tier project. I had a lot of fun building this amplifier, and it will surely come in handy at times in the future when I want to mess with certain speaker drivers in projects. Well, that's all that I have for you in this video. I hope that you were able to enjoy it and maybe even learn a thing or two. In any case, I hope to see you next time. Goodbye.